What do you believe is one of the most powerful plot construction tools currently in the film industry? The one that I teach is, uh, it's a three-step process called sequence proposition plot that was invented by William Thompson Price, but was um, sat undiscovered in his book until I found it. Um, I've taught that to uh, development executives at all the Hollywood studios, and they consistently say it's the most advanced development tool in the film industry. It's really powerful, and it's unlike anything that's out there. And it's a very sophisticated tool for both plot construction and story development. <clears throat> it um, works with reverse cause and effect and uh, structuring compelling conflict. So that <clears throat> it's as I was saying before with making the overall story work first and then making each act work in each sequence and each scene, it's, it's used for that because the first, the first step sequence is reverse cause and effect. It's the sequence of cause and effect that constitute the spine of the story, the forward progression of the story. So that <clears throat> using reverse cause and effect, you have to have the mechanics of the story sketched out first. You can't do plot construction until you have a story reasonably well figured out. Um, <clears throat> so that with reverse cause and effect, you start at the ending and work backwards so that you are you're looking at the ending and you're chaining back from each effect to its cause. So you look at the ending and say, okay, well, what would be the immediate cause of that ending? And you find the cause of that. And then you say, okay, what would be the immediate cause of that and the cause of that and so on. And so that, say it's a, it's a, um, <clears throat> Say it's a story about a uh, someone who's being muscled by a mafia don. No, someone who's being muscled by a corrupt cop. And the corrupt cop puts him in a good, strong dilemma, and there's no way out, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And this character finally figures a way out in that he makes a deal with a mafia don to set up this corrupt cop because the Mafia Don wants to take out this corrupt cop. So the character sets a trap so that the crooked cop shows up to like rob him at the, at the key point and the Mafia Don swoops in and takes him out. So the ending would be that the guy is free from the trap he was caught in before. You'd say, well, what would cause him to be free? It's that the Mafia Don snatches the crooked cop and disappears him. The cause of that would be that the crooked cop swoops in to steal the loot. The cause of that is that he sets up the heist, the fake heist, to lure the crooked cop in. The cause of that is that he makes the deal with the Mafia Don. So when you play that, and that's all right, dense part of the ending, but you could see the cause and effect there where he makes the deal with the corrupt Mafia Don, which causes him to be able to set up the crooked heist, which causes him to have the, the loot, which causes the crooked cop to swoop in and take it, which causes the Mafia Don to be able to grab the cop and disappear him, which causes him to walk out of the trap that he was in. So it's a, it's a way of, of not only stitching together the, the story components by cause and effect, but actually um, uh, creating that cause and effect where it may not exist. In other words, if you have your story roughed out and you start doing reverse cause and effect and you start chaining backwards through from each effect back to its cause, you may get to a point where there isn't a cause in what you've figured out so far 
And that may be a hole in your plot, in the logic of the plot. And you say, well, what would cause that to happen? And you may come up with a bunch of different possibilities, find the one that works, and so then you have the next cause. And then what's the cause of that? So not only are you knitting it together as you build backwards, you're taking what you've already got, a story that's that you've sketched out, but you're now, it's like, it's like the um, when when you've designed a project and you know exactly what you want it to do, then you bring in the engineer and say, okay, make all the nuts and bolts of this actually work. Here's exactly what we want, but you got to do the engineering so we know how heavy the steel has to be, how much concrete to pour. And they'll give you hard numbers of like, you need this much concrete and this much steel. So there's one thing of what you want to achieve, but there's another of, the engineer comes in and makes it all, tells you what to do to make it all work. It's that kind of thing, that as you take the story you've roughed out and stitch it together, engineer it, that you actually create the cause and effect as you build. And the trick to that tool is that you are <clears throat> asking at each point only, what is the cause of that effect rather than what happens before it. Because any number of things can happen before it, but only one thing actually caused it. So that's a way to help separate the necessary from the unnecessary. It, what it does is it frees you from the profusion of unnecessary detail. The unnecessary kills scripts. And that's one of the things I was saying, I've trained a lot of um, creative executives in, at the, you know, the studios in Hollywood in this tool, and when I talk about separating the necessary from the unnecessary, they're all going, yes, you know, the unnecessary overburdens everything. Dialogues overwritten, scenes that shouldn't be there, whole acts that should, they're, they're bombarded by the unnecessarily constantly. It's one of the major symptoms they see uh, that scripts don't work, that dialogue doesn't work, the spine of the story doesn't work because there's too much. There's, you don't have the, what's necessary and there's too much of the unnecessary. It's a combination of the two. So what merely happens before an event could be any number of things. The thing that actually causes it is gonna be among those things that happens before it, but you're finding the, the key links you're basically, you're, you're creating a chain as you work backwards. And when you create the chain for the overall story, the chain of events, and you've rigorously included only that which is necessary to the forward action of the story, and you've rigorously excluded that which is unnecessary to the forward progression of events that constitute the spine of your story, then You've assembled it backwards out of your, what the material you have, and when you find holes in your plot, you invent to, to fill them in. So you're not only structuring it, but you're also developing it. You're creating when needed. Um, then when you read it from the bottom up, A causes B, which causes C, which causes D, and so on, that's the spine of your story. Whereas before you had a lot of clever elements to a story and it looked like it worked, but you hadn't done the engineering on it to make sure it really worked. And being able to stand back and look at your story, like it starts here and it moves all through here, it also enables you to get a good objective look at what you've created so far. And it's not easy to get a good objective look at something you've been deeply immersed in for a while. <clears throat> because this plot construction comes after you've done a lot of creation and development. Then you have to stitch it all together into something that actually holds water. So um, when you stand back and look at it, you may go, oh, there's the whole spine of the story in simple terms. And you may go, Wow, that's much better than I thought it was going to be. Or you may go, God, that really sucks. I thought I had much more than this, but there it is. And blah, I got to like, and you know, it's, 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 it, can, it can be 
not working for you in any number of areas. Or you may go, you know, I always thought there was a some kind of problem in Act 2, but I couldn't put my finger on it, but boom, there I see it right there. And you can see uh, that part of it is distinctly weak and it could be so much stronger. And so, you know, maybe you fix it in an afternoon or maybe it's three weeks or maybe it takes a month. Maybe you have to read a couple of great books or talk to somebody who really lived it. And then you come back and stitch it all back together again and then look at it again and go, much better. But this one piece is still weak. So you're, you're evaluating, developing, structuring, and it's all in the process of plot construction. Um, <clears throat> so once you've done the, the sequence, that's the sequence of events that the overall story consists of, just the big picture, then, so that's a sequence out of sequence proposition plot, three-step process. So the second step comes from Price's proposition that we were talking about before using logic to pull all the story elements together into a coherent whole. Like we were talking about how Pulp Fiction has three different stories in it, but Tarantino did an excellent job of pulling those all together into a coherent whole. It's not a mess of different stuff. It's one thing that happens to be done in an unusual way, but it's still perfectly crafted from a dramatic point of view. It's, it's extremely effective dramatically. And great storytelling has got both. So once you've got this tight chain of events, then you set up a set up a conflict, set up a potential conflict early on in the story, touch off a fight to the finish later in the story. And what Price said is instead of doing A and B therefore C, he said central to our job as a dramatist is to have the audience up on the edge of their seat at the point when the fight to the finish has only just started and they don't know how it's going to turn out. So at the point when the fight to the finish has only just started, the audience comes up on the edge of their seat, like, how's this going to turn out? Because we've got a powerful, proactive protagonist, and we've got a powerful, proactive antagonist, and we genuinely don't, genuinely don't know who's going to win, how it's going to turn out. And so you set it up, you touch it off, you get the audience on the edge of their seat, and you've either got the audience or you don't. In terms of dramatic power, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much are they on the edge of their seat? If it's really powerful, then you're going, wow, yes, this, I set it up, I touched it off, and I really got the audience. If you set it up and you touch it off and you can see it's still kind of weak or it's actually quite weak, that's, the power, that's what the proposition is for. So you can propose it, take a, an objective look at it, and then evaluate it and then revise as needed. If it's only like a 7 out of 10, and you're like, no, it needs to be, I need a 9 or a 10 in terms of a scale of 1 to 10 for how powerfully I have the audience on the edge of their seat at this point when, the, when what the whole story is built up to is unresolved, then you amplify different aspects of it to get the audience that much more on the edge of their seat. So you're, you're creating a tight sequence of cause and effect, then looking at the core conflict in the story, because it's really just two boxers in a ring fighting it out. It's two dogs fighting over a bone. Only one of them is going to walk away in the end. In fact, the oldest Greek drama was only two characters on stage. The introduction of a third character by Sophocles was considered a major innovation in drama. So the ability to see the core of your plot as two main fighters in a fight to the finish and only one of them is going to walk away helps you get right at the core of what makes your story work dramatically. So um, sequence is the reverse sequence of cause and effect that makes it tight. This, you set it up, you touch it off, you get the audience on the edge of their seat, unresolved. And if you're doing your job right, the question in their mind about how it's going to turn out is really powerful. Then you've got as much dramatic power as you can bring to the to how you're dramatizing this story. And then the last step is the answering of the riddle, the completion of the action, what, how the fight to the finish 
shakes out in the back and forth between protagonist and antagonist and who wins or loses in the end. So reverse cause and effect, set up the fight, touch it off, get the audience on the edge of their seat and wrap it up. So that's sequence proposition plot. And you do that once to the overall story, which makes it tight and dramatic. And, well, I'll explain that as I go along. Then, as I said, you break the overall story up into acts. Like you literally look at the chain of cause and effect that you did in reverse, and you say, okay, that right there is the end of act one, that right there is the end of act two. So you've got your acts. So you take act one, and now you do sequence proposition plot to act one. So you start at the ending of act one, where it ends up, and you've already got, like if you had this chain of events, this part of it is act one. So you've got a chain of events right there that constitute act one. You take that over here, and you, you've, so you look at that chain of events, and you're gonna start at the end again, and work backwards through it, and think it through in a little more detail. So that you take what you've got, and you say, okay, so, the, like, the cop comes in and grabs the loot and the mafia guy grabs him and disappears him. So now you're going to think that through in a little more, it now becomes necessary to figure it out in a little more detail. You didn't want much detail when you're doing the overall story because you want to just see the main building blocks with nothing else in there because that's got to work. And if you get swamped by a profusion of unnecessary detail, it can be hard to see the forest for the trees. It can be hard to stand back and go, wow, that chain of events is the whole story. You don't want extra, you want it stripped down so you can evaluate it. Now it becomes necessary to think it through in a little more detail. It becomes necessary to layer in a little more detail. So you're thinking it through in a little more detail of like, okay, so, is it like a bag of money or is it like diamonds or is it somebody that he was supposed to kidnap for the crooked cop? And how would what, what would the rough mechanics of the trap consist of? Like where would the mafia guy be? And how do they make it so the cop really puts his foot in the trap? Even if there might be clues that he might begin to suspect or he has good instinct and he's like, something's wrong, but he still puts his foot in the trap. So you you it becomes necessary, necessary to figure out a little more detail and then you chain backwards to that, to the, to the you, you're looking at what you already created, like what was the cause of that is that he does the actual heist that the crooked cop wants them to do, but there's some falsehoods in it because it's a setup. How does that go down? How does he do it? Is the crooked cop watching? What is he taking? Is he swapping it for something that's a key part of the trap. So you're, you, don't, you don't want much detail because you, you want to, it's hard enough to figure it out and too much detail can just gum up the works. Um, and then you go back to the next, you, you look at what the next cause was and think that through. So what you've done is you may have like six causes that you started out with that you brought from the overall story and you've opened it up a bit more. So maybe now there's 12 or something like that. So you expand upon what you already had, amplifying in detail, and you've got more. Then you throw that act into a two-sided conflict where you set up a potential fight early on in the act, touch off a fight to the finish later in the act, get the audience up on the edge of their seat about how the conflict in that act is going to turn out, and then a completion of that action of what's, what's the rest of it. So you've done sequence, proposition, plot, so you've not only constructed the story, but you're literally inventing your it's story development as well. You're figuring out, okay, so what would actually be in that bag that helps make the trap work, but the cop doesn't see the switcheroo or whatever. You're gradually developing those details without getting into too much detail, but you're, you're literally fleshing it out. You're literally inventing. Some of it, you'll have the details already figured out, some of it you're making up on the spot. And then you're creating conflict in that act, which there generally will be some conflict, but you're really constructing it, setting up a potential fight, touching off a fight to the finish in that act, getting the audience out on the edge of their seat. So the act itself 
has a high point of suspense at around the two thirds, three quarters point that really gets the audience up on the edge of their seat and then complete the action. So you've made it tight and dramatic. Then you do the same thing for act two. You expand upon the cause and effect, thinking each step through in a little more detail. You amplify whatever conflict is in that act, making sure you have a strong proactive antagonist and protagonist, touch off a fight to the finish, get the audience on the edge of their seat. So act two really gets the audience on the edge of their seat. It's compelling and, and it's, it, you have a completion of the action within that act. So now act two is tight and dramatic. Then you do the same thing for act three. Then you go back to act one and break that into sequences. There are two to five sequences in that act. And you take, if this is the cause and effect for act one, then you say, okay, so if this is the bottom, the beginning, and this is the end. So you say, okay, so that much of it's gonna be the opening sequence, that much is the next sequence, that much is the next sequence. You take this chunk, bring it over here and think it through in a little more detail. You expand upon it and open it up and you're figuring out the mechanics of the cause and effect for that sequence. And you're still rigorously excluding the unnecessary and using only that which is necessary to the forward progression of the action in that sequence. And then you structure the conflict, you set up a fight, touch off a fight, get the audience on the edge of their seat and resolve it within that sequence. So that sequence, you've now fleshed it out, thought it through, made it tight, kept the unnecessary out of it, and structured compelling conflict so that it gets the audience up on the edge of their seat, two thirds, three quarters of the way through the sequence, and then complete the action. So you do that for each sequence in the story. Maybe there's 12 to 15 sequences in the story, maybe some more, but that's a lot of work. But so is 24 rewrites. So you're engineering your script properly before you write it. So you do it for all the sequences throughout the whole story. Then you go back to the opening sequence and you look at the cause and effect you've got for that and you break that into scenes. You could say, okay, this chunk of it is the opening scene, that's the next scene and so on. So then you take that chunk of the opening scene, that's the cause and effect that you've already figured out and then you, at the scene level, you think it through again, you go backwards through it visualizing it in more detail, what would be, now you're down to final detail. What would be the mechanics of who actually does exactly what? And you're paraphrasing the dialogue. So now you've got cause and effect for that scene. And then you structure the conflict in that scene because you never want any part of your story to go flat dramatically. You don't want scenes that are mere information, that are mere narrative. You want the scene itself to be tight and dramatic. So two thirds, three quarters of the way through the scene, the audience comes up on the edge of their seat. Um, so you made it tight and dramatic and then you write that scene. Then you do the same thing for the next scene. You, you, you do the reverse cause and effect, thinking it through in more detail, dramatizing it, and then you write that scene. You go all the way through writing each scene as you develop and structure it. And then you have a working draft. And so that's the function of sequence proposition plot as a plot construction tool. It also happens to be very much a story development tool. The two go hand in, hand in glove. But it's a remarkably powerful tool. Price constructed it, but didn't complete it. He explains it very clearly, but nobody else picked up on it. And, you know, I read a lot of his students' books and so on, and they picked up on proposition, and that really entered the, the lexicon of structural technique for the dramatist. Not widely, but it's, it's certainly known. Um, but none of his students were talking about sequence proposition plot. His student, who, you know, the two books that I read for three years, that student, student didn't even talk about reverse cause and effect, which Price went on and on and on about. So I was like, how could they not be seeing this? But it was like, you know, finding an old rusty tool out in the field behind Da Vinci's old workshop that had just laid there for hundreds of years and nobody ever tripped over it. And I found it and it was like, this works. And I combined it with what his students did. It really wasn't there. Price described it, 
but didn't build it at all. And he wasn't even satisfied with the proposition part of it. But his student did a lot of detective work because he knew that Price had a remarkably powerful tool, but it died before he wrote his next book and explained it. So he did a lot of detective work and pieced together, made the proposition more sophisticated and powerful. Um, and then this other playwriting teacher made the proposition work even better. And I used all of those and synthesized them together. So this was like an old tool that I found synthesized together with some of what his students said, and then I added to it, and then worked extensively with it for many years. So it doesn't really exist anywhere. And when I started teaching, people kept saying that they'd never seen anything like what I teach and that it worked better than anything out there. So partly I didn't expose myself to other dramatic writing teachers because I didn't want to start parroting what they were saying. I wanted to just stick with the, with the uniqueness of this. And it, it works, you know, it's a complete working technique. Um, but it's, it really is like nothing people have ever seen and it really works powerfully. And it's, it's very much plot construction. Uh, one of the things I say that's kind of fun is um, I only teach one thing, plot construction and dramatic principle. It's kind of a koan in a certain way <clears throat> because they're obviously two things, but plot construction comes out of dramatic principle. If you understand dramatic principle, the, that, the underlying principles that make dramatic structure work, then dramatic principle informs plot construction. They're very much the same thing in the same way that medical theory informs brain surgery or something like that. They're, they're very much different parts of the same animal. Um, okay, so I hope that was clear. Absolutely. Are both books required reading or is one of them no. out of print? Actually, neither. Um, Price's book is very dense reading and hard slogging. His student's book is really excellent, but I synthesize them. To, you can definitely learn from reading them, but you can learn more quickly from studying my book, writing a great movie, because it it's synthesized uh, a lot of their tools into a powerful unit. Price's book is kind of like walking through thigh deep mud. It's not, it's hard slogging and it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so anybody can go find it. It's, it's easy to find, but it's, it's brutally hard work. Um, and you won't find what's in my book in those books in a lot of ways.